You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Jim Hannock here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today on The Open Door, we talk politics with a decided emphasis on the experience of a member of the American Solidarity Party, Christopher Zender, serving on a Midwestern town council and on the California gubernatorial campaign of another member, (laughs) yours unruly. We have no special guests, just our regular panel of irregulars. As always, we begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mario, will you launch us into the deep? Yes. Um, Well, uh, today we are going to talk about uh, politics. And the first question that I have is... uh, since we are a member of the American Solidarity Party, I would like to know what is your take on political subsidiarity? Any of you, Jim, you want to jump in? Yeah, Jim, you jump in. Well, Christopher, uh, I I thought that this was your lead question. <laughs> Well, I'm leading here. So, I'm leading here. So I've already, I mean, already okay. jumped into the deep. All right. I'll, I'll, I think you need to uh, get us oriented at least. Well, okay. Well, I guess in some ways um, what I do is about the most subsidiary uh, aspect of subsidiarity, being a, a councilman for the village of Hartford, Ohio, population roughly 400. So that's, that's a pretty small government. But subsidiarity isn't simply about smallness. I mean, that's one of the, I think, the confusions about it, that the idea that subsidiarity means that um, political matters should only be handled at the lowest possible level or at the lowest level. It really is that, the, that, the, uh, that matters political should be addressed at the appropriate level. So those which should be addressed most properly at the local level or saving at the level of the family should be left there. And, and those, which those questions, those um, concerns, which, which, which um, address more broad, uh, that, that, that require a higher level of government to handle should be ha- answered at the higher level of government. So subsidiarity would in like the Amer- American context would include uh, township governance, it would include village governance, it would include state governance, it would include federal governance, and all those things can be fitted into subsidiarity. So it's uh, subsidiarity is only a principle that you can apply in politics. What no. about in other areas? 
Well, I think it's, it could be implied that there is wherever there's a human community, right? Um, and, and at a certain level, too, I guess you would say the individual falls under the concepts of sincerity or subsidiarity. We don't want to, for instance, take from the individual his um, ability, his ability or his po- his opportunity to achieve virtue by by his by the exercise of his own will. Uh, so, I think, yeah, I mean, when it, it, recruit, it works in the church as well. I mean, we we have a centralized, obviously, a very centralized church in the Catholic Church, but that doesn't mean that the Pope should be handling everything, or that every decision should be made by the Pope or by the Vatican. It should be made again at the most appropriate level. And um, how to determine that is not always easy, but yeah, it, it, it level business too. You would want to have, if you had a larger business, you'd want maybe your departments to make a lot of the decisions that the head of the company shouldn't have to make, that type of thing. Why is it, I have a final question for you. Uh, why is it is uh, better to deal with issues at the local level when the local level perhaps don't have the resources that perhaps a centralized government has? Well, I, I think it, it, it comes from the ability to understand the problem and understand the actors involved. Uh, parents, for instance, will understand their children better than uh, a school board will, for them, you know, all things being equal. I mean, there are always exceptions to these things. Uh, the, 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 the village council of Hartford, Ohio, is going to better understand the people of Hartford, Ohio, than the county of Licking County will or the state of Ohio will. And so... They're able to make the local governments are able to make decisions based upon uh, knowledge of intimate knowledge, which is not afforded to higher levels of government. It's just it's it's um, I think, too, it also naturally speaking, if um, we talk about priority in politics in the political order, for instance, what I mean by that is prior, not in sense of time, but prior in sense of, of dignity or prior in sense of, of causality. We can say that. The, the higher levels of governance all derive ultimately from the family as the basic unit. And so the, the family does already possess in and of itself a certain level of authority, which is not derived from any higher level of government. And ultimately, at least in the natural order, it's not true, I think, in the church, but in the natural order, higher levels of government are derived ultimately from lower levels of government. So it's, um, you, you, um, That, that level of authority has to, is, is presumed to be towards the bottom rather than towards the top. It only is presumed to be towards the top when, the, when that which is, at, which is at the lower level is not sufficient to maintain, um, maintain the work or do the work that's necessary. Um, Jim, um, how does uh, subsidiarity come into play in California? I want to give... One example, California example, and it picks up on Christopher's reference to education. And then, as is so often the case, I want to turn to metaphysics. <laughs> But we, we begin with California. Here in <clears throat> Inglewood, California, Uh, which is, uh, what should I call it, uh, a, a unit, as it were, a semi-autonomous unit within Los Angeles, California. We've had real problems uh, providing just decent education, never mind excellent education, just decent education. I well remember attending a parent-teacher conference. I was the parent. The teacher was a teacher of one of my sons, uh, Tommy. Uh, and it had been scheduled at the library at Inglewood High School. I got there and the library was on fire. So we had, we had to relocate our parent-teacher meeting. Uh, there's a lot of talk about limiting the police presence at high schools in California. And that was a case where there probably should have been a little bit more police presence. But I understand the reasons for limiting police uh, presence. Sorry. So 
that's just a background. And, and what happened after a time in Englewood is that the state of California took over, not the county of Los Angeles, but the state of California took over the Englewood school system, lock, stock, and barrel. And after a fairly indecent interval, maybe two years, the school district was more in debt than it had been before. It was already bankrupt, but it had become more bankrupt due to the tender solicitations of the state of California. Now, that's a case where subsidiarity is, is, is a complex and uh, fluid sort of thing. You try to see if something will work, and sometimes it's not clear that anything you try will work. But the idea is, as Christopher says, the people in Englewood ought to know more about their own students than the people up in Sacramento know. And the people in Sacramento said, no, we actually know more than you do. Let us help you out. And they, they didn't. And I think one result of that is there are more and more charter schools in the state of California and certainly more and more charter schools in the Los Angeles area. And once again, uh, the struggle between centralization and decentralization kicks in. Uh, who opposes the charter schools? Well, teachers unions. What? The teachers at the charter schools oppose their own schools? No. National level teacher unions oppose charter schools because after all, if you have uh, charter schools, you're going to have more independence. And what large units usually don't like is smaller units that show independence. So that's a little bit of uh, subsidiarity uh, in action and contraction in the state of California. Now comes the metaphysics. I think Christopher is absolutely on target in saying that the idea isn't small for the sake of small, much less is it big for the sake of big. The, the operative metaphysical principle here in the uh, language of saints and scholars, to wit Latin, is omne ends everything, political entities, familial entities, in fact, everything, omne ends perficitur, is fulfilled, is fulfilled in actu, in acting. And the beauty of subsidiarity is that it encourages us, us to act. And we begin by acting where we are as who we are. And when we uh, can't do what needs to be done, then we draw on the larger community. And when we can't do what needs to be done with the larger community, then we get into politics seriously, state level politics if necessary, national politics if necessary. It's not that the principle of subsidiarity is some sort of aesthetic ideal. It's not like we prefer cameo sized brooches as opposed to art door public art uh, uh, monuments. It's not aesthetic, it has to do with the very being of things. Things uh, realize themselves in action. And we can best realize ourselves in action if we are allowed to, and if we take initiative to, act where we are. And then we move ahead tentatively. As the, the late and great, never mind what uh, uh, the cancel culture says, as the late and great uh, Saint Junipero Serra says, uh, siempre adelante con juicio, always forward, but with judgment, good judgment. And I think that's what the principle of subsidiarity uh, uh, actually is. Very interesting. Um, but I still have a question, and the question is this. Given the fact that we are living in a time and I think we always have been living in such a time in some way or another where 
um, government in general are guided, inspired by ideologies. And ideologies uh, tend to be universal. They want to implement certain principles, value into government, whether it's a local government, whether it's the federal government, always tend to be universal and try to persuade people or impose people those values. So here we uh, propose the principle of subsidiarity, which begin from the local government, if you will, or for the small government or this singular unit. How we can reconcile or articulate that principle when uh, the whole culture is guided by this tend to universalism and ultimately seems, yes, all politics local, but it isn't. Because as you said, there are forces who want to bring into the local level the universal principle of that particular ideology. Well, I... I'm not. I, I don't. I don't think subsidiarity is against a universal principle. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, I mean, we want. We want. We would want to say in the United States, everybody to recognize certain things is true, right? Uh, we'd like everybody to re- recognize the principles of natural law. Um, or we used to. Yeah, we used to, but we. That, that's what we prefer, um, and, and, and recognize this at all levels. So that would. So when we're dealing with the questions of truth, we're talking about universal, something that's universal. It's, it's true irregardless of whether you're living in Hartford, Ohio, whether you're in California, or if you're in India, right? So the, it's, it's the application of, the, of, of, of governance, which is what we're talking about in terms of subsidiarity. It's, it's much more of an art, I guess, than it, it, it presupposes a philosophy of life, just like all politics need to. Uh, but yet, when we're, to, when we're talking about the governance, we're talking about art, essentially. And how is that art best practiced? And that, uh, the argument would be that, for the most part, or as much as possible, that art should be practiced at the most local level possible. Um, and the two things they they come together, I think, can come together very well. For instance, there are there are certain universal concerns which everybody recognizes. I'll give you an example here from my own village, which I think where these two things come together: subsidiarity and um, at all different levels. We had a situation long before I moved here um, where pe- the, the local stream was being polluted by effluents from houses. Um, there was no sewer system, in other words, at the time. And the stream was, is an outer fork, it goes into the outer fork of Licking River, which flows in the Muskingum, Kingdom, which flows into the Ohio, which flows in the Mississippi, and into the ocean, ultimately. So the, the effects of this, of course, are of the pollution in Hartford, Ohio, are, are potentially quite large, quite wide. Now, that would seem to be a case where you have a very good example where the principles of the city are, would say, well, that something has to be done at a higher level of government than simply at the level of Hartford. So what was ultimately imposed, I think it was by the Ohio EPA, was that Hartford had to put in a sewer system. Um, so that's ultimately what happened. It's very, it was a very expensive proposition, even with grants. There were, the village is still paying off. It's like the, one of the biggest aspects of the budget. Um, well, one of the problems of it is that we have to have higher sewer bills. The reason why we have to have high sewer bills is because even though we have a public sewer, we don't have a public water system. Everybody's on a well, and there's no way to tell who is using how much water? So the pro- some people have not been paying their sewer bills, and so there was a, there was a question: well, What do we do about these people? How do we handle this? So in the discussions, we, we talked about we didn't wa- we didn't want to penalize people who maybe are finding it difficult to pay their sewer bills because in the village there are people who are more well off, people are less well off, and some people are clearly clearly not very well off at all. So how do you, how do you handle that? And so we, at, when we were working at the at the local level, if, 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 for instance, if this went to Licking County, Licking County would just sent out would put a lien on their um, property tax, and they would simply have to pay it. Well, we put a lien on the property tax too, but at the same time, what we did is we offered them 
avenues by which they, if they needed help in paying their bills, they could get that help. So with every bill that goes, with the bill goes out or when the letter goes out announcing the lien, um, it, it gives them ways of, you know, places they could go to get aid in order to pay out their bills. Now, I think that's an example of how the fact that the village council we had a need. We really do have a need that the sewer bill has to be paid off. We don't get a lot of revenue in Ohio. At the same time, we want to be cognizant in, um, of the of the needs of the local population. And oh, I think at that level, because we were operating at, at a local level with 400 people and a, and a council of, of six with one mayor, right, we can understand the situation better than looking county, what are the state of Ohio would? And so you see these things come together. Is that an example of an application of higher truths? I think it is. I think it's, it's an example of, of a basic conviction that you have to treat people decently and you have to operate for the common good, namely the good of all, irregardless of their ability to pay and their, their, of, their, of their wealth status. So I thought that would be an example of how subsidiarity does work. So, but um, um, you in passing, I think, uh, referred to something that it seems is related to subsidiarity, which is solidarity. Mm -hmm. But what I observe as a um, try to understand uh, contemporary culture, that principle is rejected as um, naive by many people, mainly young people who are more inclined toward a notion of freedom, which is pretty much uh, libertarian freedom. And that's widespread everywhere. I'm not talking about the United States, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how then we can or encourage people to look at subsidiarity and solidarity as a positive way of understanding how um, very local and efficient government works? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think solidarity is something which will naturally occur unless it's in, interrupted by selfishness or ideology, right? Um, there's obviously a, a burg of the size of Hartford cannot exist on its own. It, it's not, it, it doesn't have, it's, it hasn't re reached that level of, of self-sufficiency, right? That, that constituted as a fully functioning, uh, fully competent state. So that, that there has to be some cooperation between localities in order to achieve whatever goods we need to achieve. And you can see that in the, in the pollution of the river example. There has to be, and when we all share a common river, we have to make sure that everybody is working together. So I think, it, I think we can, I found dealing with people on a more local level, when you actually talk to people, they can understand this principle of solidarity. Somehow it gets ruined in, in the, in when we get into the higher media levels of life or when you get into more places where people are more anonymous from one another. But in small towns, people understand that, you know, that it's at least on a very, very humble level of that in a small town, what you do is you take, you look out for each other. And that's, I think, ultimately one way of expressing it. People have expressed it in maybe not such terms of solidarity, but what, what, what the principle is, is looking out for one another. It could be looking out for one another as individuals, as families, as villages, as counties, uh, but ultimately, ultimately international, that we look out for each other because we're all, as they say here in Ohio with the COVID thing, we're all in this together, right? <laughs> so I think it's a concept which can be, uh, people can readily understand. I think we have to become to a very low level, high level of degradation in society before that is yeah before that is simply rejected. The question is, how do we get that message out in a way that, you know, have practical, have practical, real practical applications? Can I make a connection here? Yeah. Sure. I'd like to look at solidarity as the antidote for mm -hmm. ideology. Uh that's what I really want to discuss now, but I, I have to have one little lead in. Sometimes people will use the word ideology to refer to any coherent set of beliefs. 
so much so that Euclid's geometry could be challenged as mathematical ideology. If you have four beliefs and you want to show that those four beliefs are somehow interconnected and coherent, uh, given the pathetic level of public discourse, you can be accused of having an ideology. And, and that's mistaken. Now, to get to something more central, for some time, the term ideology has been used to refer to uh, a set of beliefs or alleged beliefs that are put forward uh, more or less in bad faith. And they're put forward to uh, support people who have power. And so ideology has come to mean a, 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 a bogus sort of faux philosophy, which underneath is really a, a device to prop up people in power or to put people in power who would like to be in power but are not yet in power. Now, solidarity, rightly understood, I think, is an antidote to ideology in that uh, bad sense. And how so? I, I think there are many ways of expressing solidarity uh, as a concept or uh, articulating it. But I, I like the, the uh, account of solidarity that says the first measure of justice, the first measure of justice in any society is how it acts to protect those who are most at risk, most vulnerable. Now, who is it that's most at risk? Who is it that's most vulnerable? Not the people who are in power or not the people who have enough power to be trying to grab more power, but it's the least little ones among us. And if we are just, we will, first of all, work to protect them. Now, Christopher spoke of a kind of a, a, a common sense view of solidarity that doesn't use the term solidarity. And he also spoke of our being in this together. Uh, consider a case of a, a lifeboat, and lifeboats are often introduced in political discussions. Uh, if we're on a lifeboat and some people are about to fall off the lifeboat, solidarity says, well, we're all in this together. And what we ought to do first is keep the people who are about to fall off from falling off. That's what we ought to do first. Keep them from falling off. And after all, we're all in it together. The antithesis of solidarity would be a kind of a blatant or covert perhaps go either direction, uh, egoism. Oh, that guy's about to fall off. I'm going to give him a push because I'll have more room for myself. That's the absolute opposite of solidarity. But that is, in fact, what ideology leads to if it's a, a, a smokescreen for maintaining power. But solidarity is not about maintaining power. It's about maintaining community. And as solidarists, we look first to those who are most in need of our help. And, and here's a concrete example. Uh, it's contemporary, and uh, it's something that uh, cries out to heaven for rectification. There is a tendency in this country, as there has been a tendency in the developed countries of the West, uh, to put the old folks in a home. Yes, let's put them in a home. After all, we're never at home ourselves. <laughs> we're out making money. So let's put the old folks in a home. And what we've seen during the COVID crisis is the old folks at home are the most likely folks of all 
to die of COVID. Uh, what we take to be doing them a good turn turns out to be very often doing ourselves a good turn. And we put them at a heightened risk. We immediately do so when we put them at a risk for more and more isolation. But then we put them at a heightened risk in the context of COVID. They die fast. And uh, solidarity would, would say that that is a... a uh, a defacing of uh, the community that we find ourselves in today at uh, 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 any number of levels. So that show, if I understood you well, that solidarity is a virtue, is a disposition which begin with those who are closer to us. In our society is uh, fragmented for, again, ideological forces. And yet, I have been observing something, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in small communities where people are more inclined to localism uh, against centralized government, this pandemic has shown that they don't believe in in the government, uh, by the government, of course, is an undefinable entity which is telling these people how they have to behave, what type of uh, mask they would need to wear, and they reject that because it comes from the government. So the question is how then we can bring the common good Uh, into those communities seems to be distrustful of the government itself. Well, I, I'm not sure that the government always has earned the trust of the, of the local of the localities. Uh, so why do they mistrust the government? Sometimes it's kind of a libertarian notion of freedom. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just because the government is just does things which are particularly bad. Uh, you know, so it's if the government itself has not always proven itself. I'm hearing my feedback. Okay, hearing feedback for some reason, but anyway, if the government itself is not always operated according to the common good, but out of the, it has worked uh, operated for the interests of say corporations and the like. It tends to produce mistrust in people. Or in many cases, like here in rural Ohio, I think a lot of people are mistrustful of the government because the governments tend, our governments tend to um, promote ideas, practices, which people think are immoral. There's a still a strong religious sense, mostly Protestant in, in this area, which, re, which um, reacts to um, certain government promotion of you know, same-sex marriage, um, same-sex relationships, abortion, and that type of thing. So that tends to, so that also has to be taken into account whenever assessing the actual response of people to in, in small towns and the like to larger government. There's also the problem that sometimes the governments do intervene in ways they do, in places they shouldn't be intervening. There's been an undue centralization, I think, in the United States in many ways. And so it once when when you have that level of decentralization or centralization, especially if it doesn't actually take into account the real needs of the locality, people tend to mistrust the government. So there's a whole slew of factors, I think, which are involved here, which make the assessment of, of say, the response of localities um, to government more very complex and have to be carefully weighed. Thank you. I, uh, G I would G only, yeah, I'd like to add something that uh, muddies the water, but the water is already muddy. When it comes to the question of uh, keeping a safe distance from people, when it comes to a question of, of using masks, uh, I think that a little careful reflection Uh, should lead us all to support those measures. But when it comes to the question of the vaccine, the vaccines currently in play, 
I think that uh, there's a real issue there, and I'm not saying it's the issue that motivates most people who are reluctant to use the vaccine, but the real issue is that the vaccines that we now have depend on abortions carried out in the past. Now, some will say, yes, but that's the past and all sorts of things that we do now depend on wrongful actions in the past. But the past continues in in the present. There is greater and greater and greater use and more and more uh, blasé use of the remains of aborted babies in medical research. And our Dr. Fauci, is one who has supported vigorously the use of aborted fetus tissue in ongoing medical research, ongoing medical research. And so we need to blow the whistle on that. And it ought to be more than just a whistle blowing. It ought to be said again and again and publicly. Uh, So there's that aspect of it. And also with respect to, to, to the government, to the munificence of the government, let's remember that again and again in the past, the government has had uh, uh, mandatory military drafts. And one of my favorite Wendell Berry short stories is a short story about what happened in Kentucky when the folks came back from the war, which war was this? This was World War One, and and what havoc had been done. And uh, I think that uh, there's nothing more dangerous to the human person than the rogue nation state. And so I have a, a real sympathy for people who are suspicious of the government. On the other hand. We need to have a government. Government plays a crucial role. It can play a crucial role for the good, but not unless it's grounded in an authentic patriotism. It certainly can't be grounded in commercial interests. And that grounding of the government in commercial interests is just as much a part of our American heritage as anything else. I think it was first and foremost commercial interests that led to the... uh, 1776 maneuvers. You can say something uh, about the positive strains in uh, the American Revolutionary War, but there were plenty of negative strains as well. Uh, I think one thing that history has shown us is the the truth is the first (coughs) truth is the first casualty of war. Indeed. Um, uh, precisely when I hear you talk about the complaint against the government, it seems that that, uh, in, as people generally use, that give a negative connotation to government itself. And then people fall into the other stream where one has to be self-sufficient and the government is the problem. So in that sense, there is a profound division between those who favor those who are against. That's an ideological struggle. And and yet, the government has a function. It has a purpose. And there is what I may call a middle ground, if you will. And that um, uh, place, I think, uh, is the the one that the American Solidarity Party need to to fill. now, having said that, you just mentioned the word uh, patriotism or patriots. And so, and there is a distinction between flag waivers in patriots. What is that distinction all about, do you think? Okay, that's one thing I want to, you know, what we said last, our, our previous discussion. Yeah. I think sometimes we use the term government, our, our mind immediately goes to Washington. That's the government, right? Okay. And in reality, it's, it's, it is part of the government. It's, it's the federal government, but it's not government as such. Government is at all levels. And so th- I think that's something we really have to 
rediscover in the United States. And part of it, there's very reasons, various reasons why we don't think of the government as local. Uh, and, and why people don't pay much attention to their local governments as if it's not really important when it's actually extremely important for the, for the flourishing of human life. But that's, I think, that's something important. When we talk about being anti-government, oftentimes it's anti-federal government or it's anti-state government or something. Sometimes it is just ideologically anti-government. I mean, obviously, uh, when you go back to the American Revolution, uh, like Thomas Paine's um, common sense, what presents government as a necessary evil, right? The, the liberal notion of the necessary evil rather than as something as a positive good. So there's that strain as well. But it's also, you know, the fact that people tend to focus on one level of government rather than another that leads them to these notions. So your, your, your question again was, I'm sorry, I forgot. So the distinction between flag waivers and patches, is there such a distinction? Should we be making that distinction? I think there is. Um, I think, well, part of it is there's a kind of a, what tends to develop as a kind of exaggerated nationalism. A flag waiver oftentimes is somebody who tends to take his own nation and make it absolute that his, that his nation has a kind of preeminent right to exist and that the rest of the world has to exist for the sake of his nation. In the United States, it takes a kind of a, a queer form. I don't know if this, maybe it's true in other places as well, but and it has been true in other places, but there seems to be a need for Americans to think of their country as always being the greatest, which makes me sometimes wonder if it became very clear to them that it was no longer the greatest, whether they would have the same kind of love for their country. Love for country, true patriotism is like love for one's parents. You don't have to recognize that your parents are the most virtuous or the best, the most intelligent, the richest or anything else. You love them simply because they're your parents and you come from them. That's really, I think, that's the base you, you love. So patriotism has to be rooted in the, in the conviction that this is my, these are my people. That's why I love them. And I want to work for the best of, what, best of my people, what is the common good for everybody. I think it also tends, to, we, we tended to abstract patriotism in the United States because we always we place it only at the highest level. For instance, when we have our village council meetings, what do we do? We begin with the Pledge of Allegiance to what? The federal government, essentially. Why not the state government? Why, where is the state government anymore? Where is local government in, in terms of patriotism? Um, being that we're human beings, we're, we're both, we have intellect, but we also live by our senses. I do really think that there's a, there's a, there has to be a more sensual level to the sense of patriotism that love of country is really love of first and foremost the place in where you live and that really roots it and makes it deep it becomes difficult of course in the united states because people move around so much right um to have that kind of devotion to place but i do think it, that's essential to it but ultimately you love it because it's you belong to it and it's you, you love this people because they're your people they're like your extended family and the love has to express itself in a desire to do what's good for them and, and to live in you know, solidarity towards, for the sake of the common good. It has nothing to do with how great they are, how beautiful they are, how intelligent they are, nothing but the fact that they're your people. And that's why I think true patriotism is ultimately it's rooted in the sense of the word pater in Latin, father. And you love your, you love your people like you love your father. Father Lam. Jim, any reaction to that? I think Christopher has beautifully <coughs> articulated uh, the nature of patriotism. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas treats patriotism under the category, under the heading of piety. And mm -hmm. piety he treats under the heading of justice. And justice, well, the core of justice is giving each one his due. Now, we have a, a, a special need to give our due to God, who gave us our very being, a special duty to give our, our due, to give the, the, the right uh, uh, response to our parents, and a special duty to give a right response to 
the communities which make it possible for us to, to flourish as human beings. So patriotism is part of piety and piety is part of justice. And at the very core is our sharing of a common nature. We share through God's good gifts something of his nature. We share quite clearly something of the nature of our parents. And we're social beings. And so our social nature is something that we could not sustain without the communities in which we live. And all of these factors have to be interwoven. So I think Christopher has splendidly made those connections. So... um... Talking about the American Solidarity Party, it seems to me, according to what you are saying, Jim, is that we need to build from the bottom up um, what some sociologists have called the subject, the community first, and then the political apparatus, because ultimately we need an institution in order to win elections. Now, having said that, um, I have a question. Uh, Jim, do you think that is uh, reasonable or possible or um, it's just a very, uh, it's, an, uh, it's really impossible to win the um, governorship of California? If that is the case, why? Why not win it if it's impossible? <laughs> <laughs> well, You know, Mario, truth be told, the party elders thought it was crucial that we have a youth ticket. And so when, when, the, when the consensus was reached that we needed a youth ticket, well, it fell to me. It fell to me. And furthermore, I've had a lifelong interest in Don Quixote. So, <laughs> so there are any number of factors. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in human terms, it's utterly impossible, utterly impossible that I win, win this race, and especially because uh, the competition is just heated up. This morning's newspaper tells me that Caitlin Jennings will be a candidate. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> so, so with that kind of competition, it's going to be more than tough. However, the flag needs to be flown. The American Solidarity Party has a terrific platform. It uh, expresses the best of Christian uh, social thinking, the best of, of Jewish social thinking, and we have Muslim members. So the flag needs to be flown. And I think this is an opportunity to do just that. Here in California, of course, we have the enshrinement of the culture of death. Uh, 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 there's a chance to challenge that. We have uh, this extraordinary commitment to uh, letting China go unchallenged. The Los Angeles Times, which purports to be a, a, an intelligent uh, uh, production of the best of uh, critical race theory uh, has a supplement once a month, I think, produced by the Chinese Communist Party. It's called China Watch. It's a supplement that the Times distributes, and they're paid to distribute it. They're actually paid to distribute it. And every single piece in the China watch is the puffiest of puff pieces. 
So I think that there will be some debates from time to time in the campaign, and we can challenge the enshrinement of the culture of death. Uh, we can uh, challenge the uh, uh, the uh, growing growing uh, tyranny of China, and it, we can also address in very concrete ways specific, especially specific California issues like housing. Uh, it's well known that there lies, damn lies in statistics, but here are some statistics that I think are pretty, pretty much on, on the mark. Uh, in California, our median housing costs, our median housing costs are about 47% higher than nationwide. And that makes our housing costs the highest in the nation. Uh, in terms of housing units per resident in California, we rank 49th in the nation. We have in California 125,000, give or take a few thousand, homeless people. People have been displaced from any housing whatsoever. And about 28% of our population lives in poverty. That means we have in California the highest poverty rate in the nation. Now, all of these things should be said publicly, and they should be said without any uh, cushioning of supplements from the Communist Party of China. And they should be said in a context in which we peel away the uh, incessant discussion of what celebs ought to move to the front in our celebrity culture. And California is the, the absolute citadel of the celebrity culture. And we're not going to win, but we sure as shooting can speak up and speak some home truths uh, to people who, who oftentimes are not going to hear them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so in this environment, this culture, um, if a member of the American Solidarity Party uh, find a seat like you, Christopher, in a town council, what do you do in order to keep your seat and get reelected? Well, I think here uh, the number of people who actually want to serve in the village council will not. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be much challenge. Four <laughs> members, four members of the village council are up for election in November. I'm one of them, so I'll get to run my run for a seat for the first time. But I, I, I don't think it's going to require much more than just filing the the, the fees for for the um, to be put on the ballot. So, but you know, I I, I would like to use the opportunity, however, to maybe get around to people in the village as much as I can and tell them I'm their village, I'm a village council member, to remind them there is a village council, to remind them that we actually have meetings once a month that they can actually attend. It's one of the things I've been trying to do um, through, through electronic means, through Facebook and the like, is let people know that the council's meeting, trying to get the, you know, the web page re revamped and that type of thing. So that I think it could be an opportunity for that. And who knows if I have, you know, uh, the challenger, I can, you know, I can print up my, print up my bills, you know, and put them around the, the victory sign and everything else. It's like Richard Nixon used to. Right? <laughs> that dates me, doesn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. So the mission of the American Solidarity Party is, in, is uh, also guided by subsidiarity. In some places, we can occupy certain seats because uh, people uh, are not very committed to politics or local politics. In other places, the culture is um, uh, completely um, different, uh, like uh, different than our own proposal. So. Um, now, uh, I heard once a, a political scientist say this, the following. When people are uncommitted to
democracy politics is because government is working well. Because if government is not working well, people start complaining. What do you say about that? I don't think it's true at all. I think sometimes when government's working badly and people see that they can do nothing about it, then they withdraw. I think that's probably, I think that's the case what's happened in the United States. I also think there's a good dose of laziness in the American population. There's a good dose of sometimes it's people just overworked. You know, when you have a husband and wife both working and they both both of them have to work, that you know gives them very little time, any leisure to consider anything else. But you see it on, on different levels. People joining clubs, for instance, nowadays is way down from what it used to be. That kind of civic participation is just pretty much dead in most places, from what I can tell. Um, and how to get people to to motivate people with that is hard because we really have, what we talked about earlier, we've really kind of um, gone pretty far into indivi- in a kind of a radical individualism. And uh, just concerned about one's own. So the people will complain. I've heard people people complain about things, you know, but do they do anything about it? When I was in California, I was not involved in uh, actual as a political a political power like I am now, but um, I was a kind of an insur- member of insurgency. People would be upset about certain things that were happening in the village, uh, the city in which I lived, and things we were fighting. Actually, the group I was in was fighting. But would people actually give up the time to come to one meeting, not just once a month, but a, a meeting that was to be held, a special meeting to consider a certain um, measure, to come and speak up. People said they would come, but they didn't show up. Uh, so what motivated that? I mean, they, sometimes they say, maybe they just think, well, what's the, what's the point? But other times they think, so, well, my favorite television show is on, so I don't want to miss it. And both those things, I think, are at play. We, we really do live in a time where we've, I mean, when people are not even faithful to their families or to their wives, right? They don't, they don't, you, you don't fight for your marriage anymore. If the marriage becomes too difficult, you just abandon it. So why would people have any more fidelity to a local government or to a town or to, you know, a county? Seems to be that there's a moral problem there. So that remind me that, uh, that uh, piece of, uh, uh, about the bowling alone, written a few years back by um, Professor Putman. So, um, and also what uh, I think uh, one of the chapters of uh, Democracy in America by Tocqueville, um, talking about uh, centralized government, local government, the excess of democracy, and he referred to the need for the habit of the heart. Mm-hmm. And you may say, well, he was... Um, has some love affair with the American democracy at that point. But it seems, according to what you are saying, we are uh, losing that uh, that um, dimension in our democracy. Mm-hmm. What yeah. do you think? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. I, and like I said, there are various reasons for that. Some of them are moral on the part of the citizens. Some of it is just the fact that I think people perceive that much of our government is plutocracy. It's money that speaks. It's not lo- local voices. Um, I, I've been involved in, in California when I lived there um, in what they call open forums. But you know, you're just being handled. You know, we want you to come and comment on this new project. That's going. We value your your comments. But you know, it's all going to go the way they've already determined it's going to go. And that's I think that people senses. So it, 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 there's a cynicism that develops because of that. We really don't control the government, if, um, especially when we only have two parties to vote for, and both of them are, are corporate backed, right? And I think that's a, the sense a lot of people have, so they withdraw. And I can see to a certain extent that it makes a whole lot of sense to do that. I mean, why waste your time when you can't accomplish anything? I've wasted plenty of time <laughs> accomplishing nothing in politics. <laughs> so I can understand the sense of despair. <laughs> Jim, uh, final uh, reflection. Well, the final thought connects with today's gospel uh, with all the challenges we face, with all the insurmountable hurdles that we are called to surmount. Uh, we remind ourselves that the 
the greatest victory has already been won. The greatest victory is already ours. And so today's gospel is from Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him and all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next time, time, Pakistan. I hope you didn't hear my chickens in the background during this thing. I did have baby chicks. I have baby chicks in my office right now. In the office. In the office, yeah. <laughs> in a, he, doesn't in a care about zoning. he doesn't care about zoning regulation. <laughs> Scofflaw. <laughs> Scofflaw of the worst sort. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.